वेलकम टू दर्ड लेक्चर ऑन जी पी यूज सो इन दिस लेक्चर वी विल टॉक अबाउट द डिजाइन ऑफ जनरल पर्पज जी पी यूज डिजाइन ऑफ जी पी जी पी यूज सो लेट्स टेक ए लुक एट द स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ द एनवीडिया वोल्टा जी पी यू सो एज यू कैन सी जी पी यूज आर टिपिकली लार्ज चिप्स सो दे हैव ए लार्ज नंबर ऑफ कंप्यूटिंग एलिमेंट्स so the first green box that you need to look at is the pci express interface with the host and the host in this case is the cpu so the cpu and gpu typically communicate by an external bus which is a pci express 3.0 interconnect then every gpu task regardless of whether it's a general purpose or a graphical task is a thread so gpu has its internal thread manager and thread scheduler known as the giga thread engine so think of this as kind of the brain of the gpu so this does the job of the scheduling aspect it's not much it's a very simple brain it's not a human brain it's more like a bird's brain but it's a small brain then we have these graphics processing clusters which is basically a large collection of small cores so in the volta gpu we have six of these 1 2 3 4 5 6 we have six of these and we have a large amount of on chip memory so as i said as opposed to as compared to cpu caches gpus are bigger they have more resources so they have a big l2 cache and furthermore nvidia also allows us to connect multiple gpus together so if you have one gpu they all can be connected interconnected together so then we have these high speed hubs so with these high speed hubs via the nvlink interconnects it is possible to interconnect gpus and then we have a set of eight memory controllers the eight memory controllers are then connected to high bandwidth memory all right so we'll study what is high bandwidth memory in chapter 10 so as i have said uh, all these four points are covered so the broad idea or the broad takeaway point from this slide is that every gpu has a large amount of gpu processing clusters and we have six of these which we shall see you know this is a deeply hierarchical structure but we have six of these on a volta gpu all right so coming to the gpc the gpc has a raster engine so if you go back to the first chapter where we talked about rasterization we did discuss that rasterization is not something which is amenable to parallelism so rasterization requires its separate unit and uh, so that's the reason the separate hardware called the raster engine has been provided and then uh, in this case every gpc has seven tpcs right i'll come to a second what is a tpc it's a texture processing cluster so that's like a historical name it's not that this only processes textures but this is more like a historical name for this piece of hardware so in this piece of hardware uh, we have seven such tpcs 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 in a gpc and then we have a little bit of extra graphics processing hardware so as you can see the philosophy was to limit the amount of graphics processing hardware to be as little as possible all right so the special hardware unit that we have over here along with the raster engine we also have a special hardware unit called the polymorph engine so the polymorph engine does the tasks that a regular polymorph engine is tasked to do so which we have discussed in great detail in chapter 1 sorry in in lecture 1 of this uh, series on gpus where the polymorph engine as we have seen was divided into five stages does tessellation and all of that so a large amount of the computations are actually mapped to all the cores in these sms and sm is a streaming multiprocessor which again has a large number of cores so as you can see this is a deeply 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 uh, hierarchical structure but the key point to note is that there are two separate units over here for rasterization and the polymorph engine which are kind of dedicated for graphics 
but the raster the raster engine is more dedicated the polymorph engine what it does in modern gpus to a large extent is that it tries to map the computations to general purpose units as much as possible right that is the best thing to do from an engineering standpoint such that you can reuse the gpu for uh, regular computations as much as possible so now let's drill down so where were we so we had six gpcs each gpc has seven tpcs and a tpc has two sms right so let's now further uh, dig one level deeper and look at the structure of these sms so the structure of an sm is as follows that an sm has an l1 instruction cache and it has four of these processing blocks so again you see one more level of hierarchy so just in case you have forgotten about it let me remind you it's a gpc then a tpc all right then an sm and then the sm is now divided into four pps right so for the nvidia volta we had six gpcs per gpc we had seven tpcs per tpc we had two of these sms and per sm we had four of these pps wow that's a lot so that's six times seven forty two times two is eighty four and eighty four times four is three hundred thirty six and uh, we still haven't reached the bottom level core but we are getting there so the key points over here what all the processing blocks share in an sm is the l1 instruction cache so of course one instruction in a gpu can actually do a lot because the same instruction is being executed by multiple kernels as we shall see sorry wait i'm sorry multiple threads in the kernel as we shall see so that's the reason one instruction can actually translate to a lot of instructions across the thread block of course the same static instruction but multiple dynamic instructions then we have a 128 kb shared l1 cache for data and then we have four dedicated units for texture storing texture data so this they are called a texture cache and this is required primarily because in modern graphics such as games and so on it's a much better idea to have a dedicated storage of texture caches which store only texture information right nothing more so this is again one of those units that are dedicated for saving graphics oriented information so there are four kinds of memories in an sm so what we have seen on the last slide is that we have seen the l1 instruction cache which is quite similar to an i cache we have seen the l1 cache it stores regular data then we have seen the texture cache also which stores uh, texture information so there are a few more types of caches so there is a constant cache that stores constants and we have also discussed a shared memory directive uh, when we discussed the cuda processing language so this cache over here is actually shared so whenever we have the underscore shared underscore underscore identifier it is used to store arrays in this region which i'm sorry uh, which in this case does map to the shared l1 cache so this is the reason that whenever we are writing a piece of code we need to be mindful of the resources of the gpu for efficiency and let's say that if uh, the size of our shared variables or shared arrays are more than the size of the shared cache it is not really an error but of course things will get slowed down so now let's come to the structure of a pb which is the last level because pb is the one that contains cores and contains a lot of cores so if you look at the pb the pb also has an instruction cache so it is an l0 instruction cache so if you if you would recall we had an l1 instruction cache with each sm but each pb has an l0 instruction cache and it can deal with or it can handle it can manage 32 threads every clock cycle so these threads are like a subset of a thread block right something that we had studied in the previous lecture so what we do is that we schedule or we group 32 threads into one group or one block and they operate in lockstep 
So this is known as a warp. So we'll discuss more about warps later. But what each PP has is that it has a warp scheduler. So the warp scheduler basically schedules an entire warp in one go. So we'll discuss more about what that means later. And then there is a dispatch unit, which dispatches a warp to all of these cores. We will see in a second what they are. But essentially the entire warp, which is a group of 32 threads, is treated as one atomic indivisible unit. So the fun part with a PP or a GPU in general is that the register file is very large. So just look at how large the register file is. So in principle, uh, even though PTX does assume that we have an infinite number of registers, it is not that far from reality because if you see that we have 16K 4-byte registers, which is a lot of registers, it's roughly 64 KB of space. So such a large register file is required mainly for data locality as well as to support the very high levels of parallelism that we have within a PB. So now let's count the number of cores. So if you look at it, we have eight double precision cores. So each core is, a, is like more of an embellished ALU. In a sense, it has a very simple pipeline, maybe a two or three stage pipeline. Right, in many cases, it's a single cycle pipeline as well. But the key point is that these are very, very simple cores, which basically uh, enclose an ALU pretty much. And there are few double precision units because the idea is it's a bad idea to use double precision all the time. It's expensive. So there are more of these single precision units. So we have 16 integer units and we have 16 floating point units. All right. So any warp, if let's say there is an integer operation and there are 32 threads, it will take two cycles to process the entire warp. Right, in terms of throughput, the reason being that the first 16 threads go, they execute in lockstep. So we will discuss what lockstep business means. And then the next 16 threads. Similarly, if it's a floating point instruction, then uh, 16 threads execute the FP32. 32 is single precision, a float, whereas uh, 64 is a double precision or a double. So we execute 16 threads and then 16 more. Finally, we have uh, two tensor cores. So what we will discuss in chapter 14, which is a chapter on deep learning, is that most of the operations in CNNs and in deep learning are essentially matrix operations. Matrix add, subtract, multiply, uh, primarily matrix op uh, operations. So the tensor core that we have over here is specialized for matrix multiplication. And this is a direct support for any kind of a deep learning algorithm because the tensor core directly offloads the matrix operation and essentially works on an entire matrix in one go. Of course, if we are multiplying to large matrices, then it is necessary to split them into smaller submatrices, but that is done later. And then we have a bunch of load store units to talk to memory and a special function unit. So there may be several special function units, but I've just drawn one rectangle. So the reason again is that if you look at many scientific codes, they use many tri trigonometric functions such as sine, cos, and tan. A lot of deep learning actually uses the sigmoid function that is based on computing this value. So such functions are computed in the SFU, primarily using lookup tables. So let's now discuss the concept of a warp, right? Which was one of the key concepts that emerged from the previous slide, but we didn't discuss it in great detail. So first let's do a little bit of math of the number of parallel threads that can run on an NVIDIA GPU. So we have six GPCs, we have seven TPCs, right? Per GPC, two SMs per TPC, four PBs per SM. And let's assume we can multiply, we can uh, process 16 threads in one go, which means either all of this is being used or all of this is being used. But we will then see that in modern GPUs, they can actually run two separate kernels at the same time and use both. But that's slightly more sophisticated, but the number will double. But if we just were to multiply this, 6 into 7 is 42 times 2 is 84, 84 times 4 is 336 times 16, 
is 5,376. So just look at the sheer parallelism within a GPU. We can run these many threads together in one go. If you assume that there are no memory stalls, then just look at the sheer computational throughput of a GPU. It is true that the frequency of a GPU is slightly lower. So it's not as high as 3, 3, 3.5 GHz. It's, it's lower, it's around 1.5 or so. But still, this degree of parallelism is huge. And this is pretty much like a supercomputer made of CPUs, right? We are bringing all of that within one GPU. And then if we go with the modern avatar, which is that we can execute both of these together, albeit by different kernels, or let's say different warps, then this number gets multiplied by two. So we basically have approximately 10,000 threads that we execute together. And that is a huge, huge, huge increase in the total computational throughput. So if you look at, let's say, one CPU, for one CPU, it will provide you around, you know, around best case, let's say three gigaflops, where a flop is a floating point operation per second. And just multiply this by 1000, this will become three teraflops. By 10 more, this will become 30 teraflops. So 30 teraflops is pretty much what one GPU can give you. And if you have, uh, you know, 300 of these GPUs, right, uh, then, no, I'm sorry, if you, if you have 30 of these GPUs, 33, then you can pretty much realize a petaflop machine. So it's actually not that hard to get a petaflop worth of computing just using GPUs. Of course, using CPUs, it is much, much harder, as you can see, right? Uh, but of course, if you have multi-core CPUs, then this number get, will get multiplied. So it's, it's, not, it's not that simple. So basically, this number that I gave is for a single core. And uh, it's clearly not that simple because multi-core CPUs are also better. But th that said and done, the sheer computational throughput that a GPU offers is huge, right? Is very, very large. And it is, it's quite hard to beat that. So the question is that, can we afford to give each thread its PC, right? So can the threads be executing different instructions? So this is something the clear answer is no. This would involve too much of overhead. So what do we do? So what we do is that we create groups of 32 threads in a war. I'd call them a warp. So think of this as a subset of a thread block. We give them the same PC, so because they execute the same code. So what happens is that all the 32 threads execute in lockstep, which basically means that we execute the same instruction for all the threads. So even if, let's say, there are 16 units, so for the same instruction, we first execute 16 threads, and then we execute the next 16. Once that instruction is done, we move to the next instruction. So this is what we mean by lockstep. So let me further explain in a warp, all the threads complete the execution of an instruction first, and then we move to the next instruction. So just to reiterate, if we have 32 threads in a warp and we have 16 cores, the first group of 16 threads executes, then the second group of 16 threads executes, and if let's say that we have only eight functional units, then instead of this taking two cycles, it will take four cycles. First group of eight, second group of eight, third and fourth group of something. So there are several good things about it. The first is that, you know, it's simple. No doubt. We don't have to maintain a per thread PC. Okay. So if, Let's say because of a long latency operation, so I'm now talking of a disadvantage. If because of a long latency operation, one of the threads needs to wait, then an entire warp will wait. So warp essentially does not leave a thread and go forward. Right? The reason is that we are not maintaining a per thread counter or a per thread PC. So because we don't have a per thread program counter, what we do is that if one of the threads stops, the entire warp stops, this may sound inefficient, but given the fact that GPU ports are incredibly homogeneous, right? Uh, you know, quite predictable and quite homogeneous. This normally doesn't happen, right? Normally, it's not the case that you know one uh, thread gets delayed uh, substantially. 
the reason being that also the data in memory is co-located. So normally this doesn't happen. So that's the reason it's typically not that concerning. So before you ask the question, let me answer. What about code with conditional branches? If we have code with conditional branches, then of course, as you can see, there is an if part and there is an else part. The notion of lockstep execution doesn't hold because maybe out of 32 threads, 10 threads will execute the code in, of the body of the if statement and 22 threads will execute the code in the body of the else, right? So then how do we execute by execute in lockstep? So here we do predicated executions. If you would go back to chapter five, write the lecture on Itanium. All right, then we will have the notion of predicated execution. So predicated execution is like this. Let's assume two threads. So then what will happen is thread one and thread two will process both the instructions. But for thread one, the predicate will be true, which means that this is on the correct path. So it will both process, execute and commit the results. Whereas thread two will process in the sense it will just get, get the instruction in, but it will ignore it. It will not do anything with it. So they will still proceed in lockstep. So the key point that I'm trying to make here is that all the threads in a var will still proceed in lockstep. It's not the case that lockstep execution will not happen. It is just that for every instruction, a thread needs to assess whether the instruction is in its correct uh, path or not, right? If it is on the correct path, then uh, what it will do is that uh, it will basically process the instruction, compute the results and update the state. Otherwise, it will ignore it, all right? And uh, for more of predicated execution, you can go to the chapter on Itanium, chapter five, the lecture on Itanium, the last lecture of chapter five. So let's look at predicated ex uh, execution, the previous example. Assume there is thread one and thread two. So both will execute the if statement because here they are evaluating whether X is greater than zero or not. So of course, X is a thread specific variable here. That is why this instruction falls in the correct path of both threads one and two. Now, if we look at the body of the if statement, then the body of the if statement is in the correct path of thread one, but for thread two, it is on the wrong path. So thread one will process the instructions and thread two will just ignore. Finally, the body of the else, well, for thread one will not process, thread two will process. And this is known as the point of reconvergence because this is when thread one and thread two start processing, both of them start processing the instruction. So you can say that this is where the if statement kind of ends. So this is the point of reconvergence. So how is predicated execution achieved? Well, each thread maintains a stack. When we enter the body of an if or else statement, what we do is we push our one or zero onto the stack, depending on whether we are on the correct path or the wrong path respectively, right? So let's say I'm entering the body of an if statement or an else. What I do is that I push a value onto the stack. So I'll come to a second why it's a stack. So if uh, let's say I'm on the correct path, I push a one, otherwise it's a zero. Now coming to the fact why it's a stack, well, because we could have nested if statements, right? So if that is the case, it is very well possible that I may be on the wrong path of the first if statement. And after that, I come and then, you know, maybe I do a comparison and I see that I'm on the correct path of a if statement that is nested in the outer if statement. But this doesn't matter because I would have not entered this piece of code anyway, right? So what I basically do, right, or what is supposed to be done is that the stack maintains the fact, if you see there is a last in first out behavior. The last in first out behavior comes because if I have one if statement, I have one more, I have one more and so on. Then I enter this if statements body at the end and I also exit it the first. 
So it's last in and first out. Again, last in and first out. Again, last in and first out. So the moment we have a last in first out behavior, we use the stack data structure. The stack data structure is basically used to store the outcomes of the branches or whether I'm on the correct path or on the wrong path. So to ensure that I execute an instruction, all the entries in the stack, assuming that even if I'm on the wrong path of an if statement, at least I do the comparison, right? All the entries of the stack have to be one. Then only I can say that a given instruction is on the correct path. It should be executed. Its result should be computed and committed to permanent state. Otherwise, if any one of these entries is zero, then I will say that I am on the wrong path. Okay. And the, the instruction should not be executed. So there are two conditions over here. The first is that the instruction is executed if the stack is empty. Yes, that's obvious. Or as I have just described, right, that the last in first out stack, if all the entries in the stack are one, so this is, uh, so we have a separate stack for each thread. This is not the programming stack, okay? It's a separate stack which only stores the results of predicated execution. So if all the exec entries in this predicated stack are one, so we have one stack per thread, one per thread, okay? So we maintain one stack per thread in the war. So if all the entries are one, then the instruction is on the correct path and it is executed. So when we leave the body of the if or else statement, we pop this stuff. All right. So this is what is done. That uh, we push an entry when we enter the if statement. And when we leave it, we pop an entry of the stack. So who adds all of these codes? Well, all of this code is added by the CUDA runtime. In terms of special instructions or directives or bits that are sent to the hardware, and the hardware then picks up these queues and maintains the stack for the thread. So the stack is maintained in hardware, but of course the directives of when to push and pop are given by software. Let us look, uh, now look at a slightly longer example with three threads. So in this case, we have nested if statements. So the first if statement is executed by all three threads, as you can see over here. Then we have our first if statement. So the first if statement is executed only by the first two threads and not by the third one, which is thread two. The reason being that this predicate for thread two is false. X is less than zero for thread two. Then, we execute the body of this if statement. So as you can see, the body of the if statement for thread one, both the predicate bits are one and one, which essentially indicate that it is on the correct path of thread one A. But for thread one B, even though it passed the first if statement, it was not able to pass the second if statement. So that is why for thread 1b, this predicate here is false. So that's the reason instead of put, pushing a 1 onto the stack, we push a 0. And because we have one zero valued entry, this instruction is on the wrong path of thread 1b. And that is why this instruction is not going to be executed. It will be ignored. Similarly, uh, since we are already on the wrong path, as I said, we may decide to do a comparison. We may decide to omit it. In this case, we don't do a comparison for thread two because we are on the wrong path anyway. So we again push a zero onto the stack. And so for thread two also, this instruction is not executed. At this point, threads one A and one B reconverge. So we pop the stack. So, so this entry is popped for all three. So you're left with one, one and zero. So again, for thread two, this instruction is not executed, whereas for threads 1a and 1b, this instruction is executed. Finally, we have two instructions over here uh, for thread 1a and 1b. Uh, the, uh, the else path for both of them, right, is uh, they are on the wrong path. So how did we arrive from this state to this state? Well, the moment we exited 
the if statements body, we popped the stack, it became empty. And then we pushed zero onto the stack because we are on the else path for thread 1a and 1b. So it's a wrong path. So you push zero and zero. So clearly for these two instructions, thread 1a and 1b will ignore them. But for thread two, the else path is the correct path. So that's the reason we pushed one onto the stack. So thread two will execute them. So as you can see in every stage, instructions are executing in lockstep, right? So uh, basically the same instruction. Uh, instructions are executing quite well, in fact, in lockstep. And now for the last instruction, which is x equal to c, this is where all the threads reconvert. So it's called the POR or the point of reconvergence. So at this point, all the threads, which are threads 1a, 1b, and 2, they reconverge. So then what happens is that we execute the same instruction for all three threads. So this is a good idea in the sense that using warps has made the operations of GPUs extremely efficient. However, such lockstep execution has its share of problems, and we will see why. So assume that we have code like this, okay? So if we have code like this, let's assume that we take an internal variable x, okay, and we initialize it to zero. So this is a per thread variable. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is a shared variable. And it's not a per thread variable, it's a shared variable. It's initialized to x. Then assume that we have four threads, zero, one, two, and three. So for the four threads, let's say for the first two threads, you will find the thread idx dot x is less than two. Why? Because it is zero and one. Okay. So, so this x and this x are different. So this is the x coordinate of the thread index and this, this is a shared variable. So, so they are different. So for thread 0 and 1, they will enter this if statement. And because th they are entering the other two threads, threads 2 and 3 will also enter. Because we execute this instruction, where the same instruction in the warp is executed by all the threads. Of course, for the threads 2 and 3, this instruction is on the wrong path but they will wait for their sister thread 0 and 1 to complete this. So here the fun begins. If we have a while loop over here, which waits until x is 0, we'll be stuck forever. The reason we'll be stuck forever is basically because there is nobody who's going to set x to a value which is not 0. But if you look at this logic, so by this logic, threads 2 and 3 should be executing these two instructions which of course are on the wrong path of 0 and 1, but for 2 and 3, they are on the correct path. On the correct path, they will set x equal to 1. And this is going to release the while loop over here. But the point is that we will never come here. Okay. And uh, so, so, so basically the point is that we are never, never, ever going to come here. And the reason is that the other two threads, which are supposed to set x to 1 and release it, they will not come here because they'll keep waiting for their sister threads, which are 0 and 1 to exit, right? And they are never going to exit the while loop. So we'll be stuck forever, even though we should not be. So of course, we are not assuming two threads over here. We are assuming four threads. So the point is that if you look at the simple logic, as such, there is no problem. But when you take a deeper look, you will realize that we are never going to reach this statement only because of our constraints on lockstep execution within a war. So this is, of course, a slightly contrived example. But we will find many more such situations in real life where such interactions do happen. And many times the code goes into a deadlock and the developer has no clue why. So that's the reason in modern GPU design, such situations have been avoided. To precisely avoid such situations, which may arise inadvertently in an execution. 
there is a notion of limited yet controlled thread divergence. So let us consider the two code blocks. So let this be the while loop. Let's call it W. And the other code block, let's just call it X for the one that's setting X equal to one and Y. So what we can do is that we will not stop our basic lockstep execution paradigm. We will go with what is called restricted lockstep execution. We'll execute the while loop for some time, which is the first point. We execute the while loop for some time. We see that we are not making progress, right? So this can be seen that, you know, the while loop is just going on and on. So of course, we can't detect an infinite loop, but at least we will see that uh, we are there in one region of code for some time. We can then go to the else part and again execute it for some time. This again will follow the lockstep paradigm. So all the threads will again execute the else part. Of course, all the predicate relations will be preserved. So only for all the threads whose predicates are all one in the stack, they will execute, others will not. We have seen that. So the X and Y blocks will be executed. The advantage of doing this over here is that X equal to one will be set by some thread. Doesn't matter who. Finally, we can come back to the while loop and the two threads which should have executed instructions in the while loop, they will execute it. And basically, the others will ignore, but at least they will exit the while loop. So since the if part and the else part, both the thread, all the threads have exited both, we can enter the point of reconvergence over here. So what you are basically seeing is that we are again coming back to the while loop after executing the else part. So this was the if part, this was the else part, and this was the if part for the second time. So we're again coming back to the if part. So this is an example of restricted log step execution where we are not really letting the threads diverge or go their own way, right? So the threads are still executing together. They are still in log step mode. So we are referring to this as the restricted log step execution. Where, as you can see, there's this if else if kind of jump. So this allows for reconvergence as we have seen. And the deadlock situation that was arising here in the previous thread, uh, in the previous example, I'm sorry, uh, this is not arising over here, right? So this was one of the big inventions that happened in NVIDIA Volta and has subsequently been kept. And uh, because this was required, otherwise there were many of these sticky kind of race conditions, which were happening primarily because of our you know, insistence, uh, dogged exists, uh, insistence on log step execution. So now we're in the position to see the GPGPU pipeline uh, kind of in full glory. So this is, let's say the pipeline of a PP. So we have a fetch logic and an instruction cache which uses both the I0 and I1 levels. Then we have a decode. So then the rest of the, so then the scheduling part, the warp scheduling has, uh, so the decode could be part of the fetch, could be part of the warp scheduler, doesn't matter. But the key aspect of the warp scheduler over here is that it uses a scoreboard. So we have seen a scoreboard earlier, so that's the reason I'm not explaining it once again. Uh, we have seen it when we were discussing Atanium, which was the last part of chapter five. So if you go to the video, the last part of chapter five, you will find the videos on Itanium. And the videos on Itanium have a discussion on the scoreboard. The scoreboard is nothing but a hardware data structure that keeps an instruction stalled until there are no hazards. So the hazards are of four types. And structural hazards. So until these four hazards, there is no probability of any, any correctness problem happening because of these hazards, we just stall an instruction. After that, we issue. So since the scoreboard has been discussed in detail, I'm skipping that part, but this was discussed in detail in Itanium. And finally, we have the register file access. As you have seen, the register file is a, is looks like a memory in a PB. 
And then we have a bunch of these functional units, which could be the integer ALU, floating point, single precision, double precision ALU, special function unit for sine cos transcendental functions, load store units. Load store units talk to the L1 cache, the shared L1 cache, and finally to the DRAM. Right? So, so I forgot to add an L2 cache over here. There should have been there. But still, the GPU DRAM has a very large role to play in the GPU because a lot of the data, because we're dealing with big data over here, a lot of the data ultimately ends up getting stored in the DRAM. And for regular functional units, once the operands have been calculated, there's a register write back, and we again write the results back to the register file. So this is as such a regular pipeline. The scoreboard is new, but the rest are not that new. The scoreboard basically tracks the dependencies and stalls instructions until the dependency is met. And it's an in-order pipeline. It's not an out-of-order pipeline. It's primarily an in-order pipeline to a large extent. But of course, you will see in, in order pipeline, wow and war hazards don't come up. So basically, there is a very small amount of outer orderness over here. And uh, which is sometimes, you know, if you have this kind of execution, as I just showed on the previous slide, there is a limited amount of that. But in general, it's the job of the scoreboard to take care of these issues, right? Particularly when we are executing threads in this fashion, is the job of primarily the scoreboard to take care of it. So the important question that needs to be answered now is that if let's say we have 32 load instructions in a work or 32 store instructions, pretty much one instruction per thread, what do we do? How do we access it? So let us first count the number of bits that we need to read at the same time. So of course, same time need not mean the same cycle, but let's say in the window of two or three cycles. So it's 32 cross 32. Well, why? Because we have 32 threads in a war and each value is 32 bits. So this is 1024 bits or 128 bytes. So this would require a very high register read bandwidth and a very high register write bandwidth as well. So if I were to argue in a different way, so you may say that, look, instead of sending 32 requests per cycle, we may send 16 or we may send eight. Well, that's, that's fine. So if we send 16, you should also factor in the fact that if let's say an instruction has two operands, we are not reading one operand, we're actually reading two. So this will become 16 times 2, 32. Again, multiplied with 32, it will remain 1024 bits. Right? And let's say if we send eight, well, then it will become 512. But that's still a lot of bits. A simple yet impractical solution could be that we just have a register file bank. A bank is nothing but like a sub-register file. And then each entry could be 1024 bits where all the entries are kept together, where all the information is kept together. This is impractical. Okay, this simple idea is impractical because we don't know in advance which registers we'll access and whether they'll all be kept at the same place or not. So this is rather impractical and doesn't work that way. And also reading out so much of data takes a lot of time. A far more efficient solution is to actually split the register file into multiple banks, sub-register files, and distribute these 1024 bits across these register file banks. So one bank can keep, you know, let's say 64 bits or 128 bits. <clears throat> if let's say it keeps 128 bits, then uh, across eight banks, the data will be distributed. So we'll need to have an elaborate network. So that is what the crossbar network is, which is controlled by an arbiter circuit to access all those banks which have the data, read them or write them. So let's look at read because read is more performance sensitive. And we put all of that data in a dedicated hardware structure called an operand collector. So the job of the operand collector over here is to basically work like a temporary buffer 
till the data is completely read from the register file banks. So clearly we're accessing multiple banks. So from each bank, we're reading a lesser amount of data. So what is happening is that this is a fast access and also there is parallelism. We have exported the complexity to the network. That's the reason we need an intelligent arbiter. But once that is done, all the 1024 bits can be read and they can be stored in the operand collector. And from the operand collector, the data can then seamlessly pass through to the execution units and the execution units can then execute on the data, execute the function, whatever it is, add, subtract, multiply on the data. So the key innovations over here are the crossbar network, the arbiter and the operand collectors. So as we have discussed, the simple yet impractical solution is to just make a register file bank entry wide, 1024 or 120 bits wide. That's, that's not practical. We have to have a large number of banks in the register file, use the operand collectors to collect the values, and then use the on-chip network to route register file values to the operand collector as we have seen. Even in the L1 cache, when you are accessing the caches, not L2 to that extent, but L1 definitely, there is a far elevated chance of bank conflicts. The reason is if you are writing data, we are writing 128 bytes, or it's maybe easier to say 32 memory words, where a word is four bytes. So clearly, if you are accessing multiple banks, there is a chance of bank conflicts in the sense that a single bank may con two of these words. So if you have concurrent accesses to the same bank, that's a problem. So what we can do is we can have a dedicated piece of hardware that will send all the mutually non-conflicting accesses to the banks first. So out of let's say all the accesses, let's say 32, we might find 25 accesses that are mutually non-conflicting, we send them first. Then in the rest of the then the rest of the accesses are sent to subsequent cycles, are sent to the banks in subsequent cycles. So they're gradually drained off. For writes, what we can do is that, let's say if there is a cache line, uh, then uh, what will happen is that data will either gradually come in because of bank conflicts and so on. So whenever we bring in a line from a lower level, we can lock the line in the cache. And let's say we'll have an MSHR kind of structure. So we'll discuss that in great detail in chapter seven. But what we can do is that, let's say, uh, I'll give a realistic scenario. So let's say that in the L1 cache, there is a write miss. So the block has to come from L2. In the time being, a lot of reads and writes would have arrived at the L1 cache. So they're buffered in a temporary structure. That'll be called an MSHR in the next chapter. But in this chapter, let's call it a temporary structure. So the temporary structure will hold on to all of the outstanding reads and writes. And the moment that the block comes from the lower level, we'll basically replay all the load store accesses for the set of all the lines that arrived in the shadow of the miss, which means when the miss was being serviced from the lower level, whatever reads and writes we got, we immediately apply them to this block over here. So now we have reached the end of the chapter. So let me quickly conclude. We always have five concluding points. GPUs are no doubt a vital requirement in modern numerical, scientific, and high performance computing. They are required for accelerating graphics based applications, no doubt. CPUs, in comparison, have severely inadequate resources. Early stage GPUs were too customized for specific applications. But then GP GPUs arrived on the scene and they had a very generic application. The CUDA language was developed to basically run generic ports on the GPUs. A CUDA binary is a fat binary that has both GPU and GPU specific code, CPU and GPU specific code. And GPUs have a complex hierarchical structure with five to 10,000 cores these days, which is massive, right? Several teraflops of computational power is there within one single GPU. So here we have a GPC, then a TPC, SMPB, and a bunch of ARBs. 
a warp requires 1024 bits in one go. This necessitates a complex and a multibank register file and a complex multibank L1 cache as well. So we will discuss in the next chapter on caches a lot more about the way that these caches are designed because what you would have realized by this time which is at this time meaning that we have completed the first part of the book where we have discussed out of order pipelines and gpus and it is possible to embed a sea of computational units and increase the ipc for some quotes not for all but the memory system can be a bottleneck because the memory system also needs to provide data at a high rate and also read out results at a high rate. Correct? The memory system could be a bottleneck. Given the fact that the memory system is a bottleneck or can be one, we should invest a lot of our resources in designing a very fast and efficient memory structure, memory system, I'm sorry. So this will be the subject of study in the second part of the book, which is from chapter seven to 10. And the lectures, for this, you will find on the website for chapter 7 to 10. So kindly follow.